Welcome to Captains of Industry, I'm Lindsay Williams. I'm sitting in the showroom, the main showroom of Shemansky, and I'm surrounded by the most beautiful stones you've ever seen in your life, millions and millions of dollars worth. And with me today is the founder and owner of Shemansky, and that is Yaya Shemansky. Yaya, you must be, do you ever get nervous about sitting around so much wealth and beauty? Does it ever unnerve you? I am not really. First of all, we, we used to work with diamonds for, for many years, and and I think it's, it's something that we love doing, and uh, no, not really. Just behind me now, incidentally, is a two million US dollar diamond, a round cut pink, which is which absolutely tiny, but more of the diamonds uh, later. Let's get on to you now, yeah, yeah. How did you get into this? Because you were born in 1967, and you came into a seafaring family, and from the age of two or three months, you were sailing the seven seas. Uh, yes, I guess the traveling bug um, came at a very early age. Yeah. Um, but um, I did come to South Africa in 1991 after spending two years in Japan, basically dealing in diamonds in the Japanese market. <clears throat> and this is where I learned that if it's not perfect, it's never going to be good enough. Um, so I rather spend time of perfecting the, the art of diamonds. And um, I came to South Africa and started selling jewelry in the flea market in South Plaza in Durban. And, and slowly, slowly opened the first store in the pavilion Westville, which was still there until today. And, and, and I got into it by, by challenging the current status quo or the, or the current um, availability in the market from diamond cut to jewelry design, um, introduction of platinum to the market, and, and I think other things. So you came from uh, overseas to South Africa and taught South Africa about what it actually produces, and that's diamonds. You, you saw a niche, you saw a gap. Um, look, I came actually to South Africa visiting. Um, I met a beautiful girl, she's now my wife. Mm -hmm. And I think this is what... Did you give her a diamond? Definitely, yeah. <laughs> That's the reason that I decided to stay. And initially I started with designing jewelry for customers using other supplier diamonds. Um, when I saw there is a better way to cut and polish diamonds and have a consistent um, quality, we started to, to buy and polish myself. It was quite a, a long learning curve and quite costly. But as I progress, I learned a, a bit more about the art of diamond, cutting and polishing, the optics and the way diamond handling light. Just forgive me, but wasn't Northern Europe and Israel the center of the diamond cutting and polishing industry, places like Belgium and, uh, and the ne Netherlands? I mean, look, uh, traditionally, Antwerp was the center for diamond um, polishing and rough trading. Um, now a lot of it moved to Dubai I think because taxation. Israel still polish almost half of the world diamond by value. Yes. Uh, most of the small diamond have been polished today in India and China. Um, but South Africa still polish quite, quite a meaningful amount and, and in fact on top of the world in terms of quality of, of diamond cutting and polishing. I think it's in the blood of, of South Africa to polish. I think uh, the, the one of the government's uh, goals in the future is to beneficiate. In other words, you know, when we produce the gold, we produce the platinum, we produce the diamonds, but we don't get the added value. And that beneficiation is apparently happening because I was with somebody from Rockwell Diamonds the other day, and they have a, a cutting operation in, in Johannesburg. So it's growing, and that's how it should be, I think. Um, look, there's certain regulations, so I think for uh, producing mine in order to export diamond without paying the 5% tax. They have to produce 10% locally to get a tax exemption. So I think this is why you'll see a lot of mining company opening a side cutting and polishing operation. And as a result, they're benefiting of exporting the rest without paying tax. And um, it is, I think, a drop in the ocean compared to what it used to be. And the labor also play a role. I mean, the South African labor is more expensive than Asia, China, and India. So if a diamond is less than two or two and a half carat, it's almost not cost effective to polish it in South Africa. Mm. Are the skills available or do you train people? Um, I think there is, there is a fair amount of skill. <clears throat> There's a big gap with the new generation. Um, so I think training is quite important, but also you need to have availability of diamond to be able to sustain the diamond cutting and polishing business. 
Tell us about the operations of Shemansky. You, you started out in Durban, as you said, but uh, you've, you've you progressed. You've got a number of showrooms. You've got a number of cutting and polishing centres. Can you give us an idea of the structure of the company? Uh, and we do run the Shemansky stores, which is the retail operation. When we're actually selling our jewellery design um, and the diamond that we cut and polish in-house uh, to the public. And we also introduced platinum to South Africa in the early 90s. And I think we, we fairly specialize on delivering exceptional world-class quality at good value for money for the customers. And the diamond operation, it's a standalone business. So we buy diamond direct from the mines, from the tenders, we cut and polish. We also export diamonds um, to other countries, um, to Asia, um, to the Mediterranean, to the US. So we also do export of Polish diamond from here. It's a mysterious business, the, the diamond business. It's not like gold, which is traded on the commodity exchange in New York, and you know that gold is trading at $1,220 an ounce and how much volume there's going through and where it's housed and everything. With diamonds, it's all a little bit mysterious. Is that mystery justified? Is it a, is it a cloak and dagger business? Um, look, I think there's a lot of myth about diamond. Um, we're much in favor of transparency. Um, the diamond jewelry market currently, it's an region of $70 billion which majority still lie in the US, with China and India not far behind. Um, so you do have the figure of, of the officially mined diamonds. The unofficial, it's a very small amount compared to the official. So in a way, there's, there's quite a strong transparency in, in today's market. And um, with the big supply from Asia, we, we definitely are bound to see a big shortage in diamond. Most people have um, some sort of little trinket uh, when, they're, when they're in an interview like this, uh, to, 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 some little habit. You've got a habit there of um, playing with an enormous diamond. Uh, yeah, yeah. Can you just show that? Uh, show that? G give it to me for a second. If as you long know. as I get it back. Uh, get it back to <laughs> 47 carats is the most extraordinary uh, looking stone. I'll give it back to you because it's already making me nervous. Give us an idea. This is the best way to describe the business. Where did that diamond come from? How did you, how did you come across it? How much did you pay? We don't have to tell me how much you paid for it. But the, the source of it and how it comes into your hands now. Look, that specific diamond was origin from one of the mines in the Kimberley area. And we go once a month to Kimberley, Volmenstad and Johannesburg to buy from the various mines and, and also from the tender house. And we compete on the international market. And but this diamond specifically being a Michael diamond, which is our own patent cut, and we are able to pay a little bit of more premium on the uncut in order to, to get the diamond and compete with the international buyers. And, uh, and as a result, we're able to polish um, the quality that we need. That's 47 carats now. What was it when you got it as an uncut stone? Um, it was just over 100 carats. Mm. But again, it took about uh, over two years to design, polish and decide what to do with the diamond because it's not a decision that you take lightly. No. You seem very attached to it. Are you going to sell it? Not at this stage, no. 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 <laughs> because it's unique, because it's your flagship, because you've patented the design. Yeah, but because I also like it. Mm. And, and in Darwin, the simple rule, if you can't replace it, don't sell it. And, and I think that's a very simple rule that we live by. And it's also quite a, a nice showcase to show the quality of the Michael Diamond cut to various visitors from around the world. And, and also to actually see the potential of a diamond um, in, in the different cuts. So you, until you make that one a brother or a sister, that is going to stay with you? Um, I think it's going to stay for quite a while mm. at this point, yeah. <laughs> so it's a portable investment and also an investment that over the years has probably gained in value. For example, when you first started in the business, what has been the appreciation of, um, of a oh, diamond? I know obviously there's different grades, but give us an idea. Look, in general, if you take 10 years ago, in rent terms, at least at least between eight to 10 times. Um, in dollar term, probably, you see also probably, i will say about 150 to 200% in some instances, it's fairly easy. Mm. And that one are just beginning to appreciate because the pipeline is getting dry between the supply and demand. So probably by- Explain that. Um, there are currently quite a lot of diamonds in the pipeline, meaning in cutting, manufacturing, in, in, in the wholesalers. And with the demand coming from China and India, that plumbing is getting dry by the day. So by 2016, the wholesale gap will be over $3 billion between supply and demand. And that definitely will lead to high increase in, in diamond prices in dollars. And also the US currency, we more likely will depreciate against the Chinese strong yuan and other currency, which will result also in diamond going up in dollars on top of that.
We'll talk a little bit more about that um, after the break, Yaya, but uh, tell me about the South African diamond industry. I mean, it's, it's, people have perceived it as being in decline ever since De Beer, De Beer's J, uh, delisted from the JSE uh, Securities Exchange. You've got Rockwell, you've got Gem Diamonds, you've got Petra and a few others. Are we producing the stones? Is the supply still there under the ground? Look, there's a lot of diamond under the ground. Um, I think it's a very simple calculation of, of cost, input cost, um, opposed to, out, to output. Um, there may be a bit of a slowdown in investment because labor unrest in the mining sector. But uh, remember one thing, a diamond which is in the ground is still there, mm. and it will, be, it will be mined. And we've got also Botswana as a neighboring country that is a, the largest producer currently in the world. And, and South Africa is still a very important producer of diamond and especially very large diamonds. Mm. We'll pick this up after the break. The captains okay. of industry will be back in a moment. Yeah.